Hi, this is Robert White from Tufts University. I'm going to give you a quick talk on one of the technologies we're developing in our lab. This is a capacitive micromachined ultrasound Doppler velocity sensor. And the work was conducted in collaboration with Draper Labs. The main students on the project were Minchul Shin and Zhengxin Zhao. And uh, this is a summary of a talk which was given at the Acoustical Society of America meeting in October, October of 2012. The goal of this project is to create a MEMS-based ultrasonic sensor system. We're thinking of this as a possible complement to existing radar, laser, and infrared velocity and distance measurement systems that can be used in small-scale mobile navigation systems. In comparison with radar, laser, infrared, MEMS ultrasonic systems have the advantage of small size and low cost and low power consumption. We don't ha expect them to have the high accuracy of a laser system, but we would expect them to be lower cost, lower size, and lower power than a laser system. Really, uh, this project is an exploration of the capabilities of a system like this. We're not yet claiming that this can outperform other systems, but we hope that it might be able to be complementary and to be used as part of a sensor suite and be advantageous in certain situations. The main operating principle of these systems is Doppler velocity shifts. So if we have a transmitter and receiver which are producing ultrasonic waves at this location and those waves are traveling out and bouncing off a reflector and coming back to the receiver, if there's a relative motion between the reflector and the transmit receiver array, the received acoustics will have a frequency which is shifted relative to the transmitted acoustics. This is known as a Doppler shift. In the case of a moving reflector, the uh, Doppler shift for relatively low velocities is equal to the transmit frequency times twice the relative velocity divided by the speed of sound. And this is true as long as the relative velocity is small compared to the speed of sound. So if we were to look at a frequency response, say we're transmitting here at this transmit frequency, which is the peak frequency of our uh, transmit and receive system, and then there's a velocity where the reflector is moving towards the transmitter receive array, the receive signal will be shifted up in frequency by some amount delta f, which depends on the, vo the relative velocity, and then we'll be able to receive this. If delta f becomes too large, then this frequency will shift out of band and be hard to detect with our sensor, which has a preferred band of detection. Um, but as long as it stays within this bandwidth, then we should be able to detect it. There are a few major design considerations. The first is operating frequency. If we operate at higher frequencies, we'll get a larger delta f for the same speed, so this would enhance velocity resolution. In addition, for the same aperture, we would get a, a narrower beam, which would give us a more directional sensor, reducing reverberation from the environment. However, if we go to too high of a frequency, we'll have problems with absorption, because absorption scales as frequency squared. So as we go up in frequency, we lose more energy to absorption in the air, reducing the range at which we'll get a good reflection. In our case, we've chosen to operate at 180 kilohertz. This gives us a delta F of 10 hertz for a 1 centimeter second relative velocity. That means if we need to detect a 10 hertz shift, we should be able to do that using a simple Fourier transform if we uh, take a tenth of a second of data. So we'd be able to get 10 velocity updates per second with a resolution of 1 centimeter per second in velocity. For a 1 centimeter square chip, which is the size of our array, we would predict a 10 degree minus 3 dB beam width, so that's 5 degrees either side of center, which is a relatively tight beam. This is something that distinguishes our system from other ultrasonic sensor systems you may have seen for mobile robotics. Typically, those systems that are commercially available operate at lower frequencies, maybe around 40 kilohertz, and have much wider beam widths on the order of 45 degrees or higher, which causes much more reflection off of the environment and uh, uh, not such a directional sensor. For this kind of frequency, we would expect to see about 7 dB per meter of absorption in air. So since this has to go out and back, that's 14 dB per meter of range for a round trip motion. So as long as we have enough signal and enough uh, resolution on our receive side, we should still be able to get reasonable range. But that depends on how things work out. So we'll see how that goes as we, as we move forward. Some other things to think about. The quality factor of the system. If we have a high Q system, we'll get a higher sensitivity and a higher output at peak. Our, our peak will be taller in our frequency response. Um, however, the bandwidth will be narrower. So this means that if we have too large of a frequency shift, it will get out of band and we won't be able to have as high of a sensitivity for detection. So we're really trading off sensitivity for bandwidth in this case. So we're choosing to target a Q of around 8.5. Uh, the reason for this is that this would mean a 20 kilohertz uh, delta F, so the 3 dB bandwidth of that of that second order system would be 20 kilohertz, so that's t 10 kilohertz either side of the main peak. Uh, 10 kilohertz would be a Doppler shift uh, 
that would be produced by a five meter per second motion. So we're now we're with this Q. If we go down to half power uh, bandwidth, we'll have a range of minus five meters per second to plus five meters per second. We might be able to measure larger velocities than that as long as the signal is strong enough. But uh, at half power, this is the the dynamic range of the sensor as determined by the Q. Another thing which might be of interest and, and concern in the design is the stray capacitance. Basically, we always want to reduce stray capacitance. So if we have a larger capacitance, we get lower sensitivity if we use a voltage preamp scheme, and we get higher noise if we use a charge preamp scheme. In either case, that means a lower signal-to-noise ratio. So we want to reduce stray capacitance as much as possible. This is the design of our element, our transmit element. We have a glass substrate. This is used to reduce stray capacitance. So instead of using a silicon substrate, we use glass, so there's no capacitance to the back. We have a bottom electrode, which is made of chrome gold on the glass. And then we have a nickel structural layer, which is 9 microns thick with a 5 micron air gap in here. And so this system can either be used to transmit by driving an AC field across here, which will cause electrostatic forces to create vibrations of the nickel and therefore generate acoustics, which propagate out into the air. Or we can use it in receive mode, where we put a constant DC bias across this, allow ultrasonics to come in and cause vibrations to the diaphragm. Then as the gap changes, we'll be able to measure that change in capacitance using either a voltage or charge preamp scheme. There are holes through the diaphragm. These allow it to static pressure equalize at DC, so we don't create a barometric pressure sensor. And also, the uh, size of these holes sets the Q of the device. So by controlling the vent hole size, we can get the desired Q. A combination of factors produce the desired resonant frequency, the diaf diaphragm thickness, its material properties, the size of this backing cavity, which affects the acoustic compliance, and also there's contributions from the environmental impedance. And all those things are taken into account in our mathematical models to design the size of this diaphragm. I'm not going to go into the models in this uh, video, but um, we do have models, which you can see in our papers. The individual transducers are, are arrayed in this hexagonal array, so we can get 182 elements onto a 1 centimeter squared chip, and um, we end up with a 600 micron diameter diaphragm. The backing electrode is smaller than the diaphragm because there's not much motion around the outside, so by making the backing electrode smaller than the diaphragm, we can still maintain almost the same sensitivity, um, but reduce stray capacitance. These are microfabricated using a nickel on glass surface micromachining process. We start by depositing chrome gold electrodes by sputtering and patterning, patterning those with liftoff. We then put down a tie copper uh, layer by sputtering, pattern that, and then plate on thick, 5 micron thick copper as our sacrificial layer using a photoresist plating mask. We uh, then do use a second plating mask of thick photoresist and plate on the nickel structural layer, the 9, 9 micron thick nickel structural layer, remove that photoresist, and then etch out the sacrificial copper in a wet etchant, which is highly selective to nickel and chrome gold, so that we produce our released structures. Here's some photographs of what the chips look like after they're done. So you can see their released diaphragms. Here's the bottom electrode, which you can see behind the nickel. You can see the holes through the diaphragm, which are used for the release etching and controlling the Q and, and this uh, static pressure equalization. And you can see the chrome gold interconnects running between elements down here and where the, the uh, interconnects come out to the pad. So this pad is connected to all the bottom electrodes, and this pad is connected to all the tops. There were a few keys to getting good results in fabrication. One was using a liftoff resist in order to reduce particle generation during liftoff. Another thing which was important was continuous filtration and agitation of the nickel and copper plating solutions to reduce roughness and particle count. And finally, we had to get the uh, sacrificial gap up to 5 microns and the structural thickness up to 9 microns to, to avoid stiction during release. Our electronics are built at the board level using surface mount components. So there's a ZIF socket here, which has the MEMS chip uh, plugged into it from the back side. The MEMS chip is wire bonded into a dip package. We have all of our op amps and uh, bias ICs here to produce the DC bias and to do the signal conditioning on the receive coming back from the receive element. And then those have their gains and their uh, filter characteristics and then provide an output which comes out of our, our analog out here on a SMA connector. This whole thing is put into a shielded box to reduce EMI, which is important. We have two systems then. We have our receive 
chip and a transmit chip. Each of them is mounted inside of one of these shielding boxes. You can see the, the chip there in its package with this little window with the wire mesh over it. And then the same thing on the transmit side. For beam pattern testing, we set up like this. So we have the receive system stationary. The transmit system set up on a rotation stage where the axis of rotation passes through the center of the chip. And so we can rotate this and then look at what our receive response is at different angles. So here's a polar plot showing the receive response we get back as we rotate through 180 degrees. So you can see in the center we get our maximum response of about 40 uh, dB ray 1 millivolt RMS, so about uh, 100 millivolts RMS. And uh, that's at a 10 centimeter distance. As we rotate through 180 degrees, our side lobes are down by about 10 to 15 dB. And you can see that the 3 dB beam width is indeed about 10 degrees, 5 degrees on either side of center as predicted. There's a little bit of asymmetry to this beam pattern, and that's probably because of the asymmetry of the packaging scheme. A major concern with these systems is range. So if these ultrasonic signals are propagating out into the environment, reflecting off of something and coming back. There's a lot of losses in that process, and if we don't get enough signal back, then we won't be able to hear that signal above the background noise, either the electronics noise or the reverberation level from the room, which is the, all the spurious reflections where ultrasonics that are, are coming from our transmit array are reflecting off of all kinds of other things in the room, not the reflector we care about. So for testing, we have this 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter square plate. Uh, we tried aluminum, plywood, and acrylic reflectors. They all perform similarly. And we move this back to different ranges, and we measure the response that we get as we move it back. Um, we try to keep it normal to the beam and centered. So here are the results. The points here, the circles, crosses, and diamonds show you for the three different kinds of reflectors, the receive response in dB relative to 1 volt RMS, as we move uh, distance away from the plate. So as we get out to about one and a half meters, the signal that we get re reflected back drops below the background reverberation level and we can no longer distinguish the signal coming back from the reflector. It's no larger than the signal coming back from scattering off of all the other elements in the environment. We are reverberation limited, not noise limited. So the noise floor for the device is down here around minus 71 dB. And the reverberation level in the environment that we tested in in my test lab was about minus 66 dB. If we did this in an anechoic chamber, of course, the reverberation level would drop. But for a realistic environment like a room, this is where the reverberation level is. So that means we have about a one and a half meter uh, range for this device, so a three meter round trip. And uh, also the uh, dash line here is the model just showing that we can account for all of the losses that we see here using classical absorption coefficient in air and geometric spreading, so they're very well. Uh, accounted for by those two factors. The next thing we did was to see if we could actually measure velocity. So we have a system set up where we have a moving plate, which can be controlled by a uh, closed loop control uh, PID controller. So we can drive this at different velocities, and then we have our stationary transmit and receive array, and we measure the response coming back from the receive array and using the Doppler shift compute the velocity of this plate. For ground truth, we have a laser optic uh, a fiber optic laser vibrometer, which is also looking at the plate, and that measures the velocity of the plate for comparison with the Doppler system. Here's a photograph of the setup. You can see the rails, belt drive. Here's the plate, which moves back and forth. Here's our transmit and receive arrays. Here's the laser, and there's the laser spot. And so we're measuring the uh, motion of this plate as it moves at different speeds as controlled by our closed loop controller. Here's a typical measurement from the laser. So this is versus time. We tell the, the plate to execute a move, so it accelerates from zero up to some desired velocity. It's supposed to maintain that velocity and then drop back to zero. But there's considerable fluctuation in the actual velocity of the plate because of vibrations in the structure and some stick slip on the rails. So there is actually quite a bit of velocity variation during the move. But the laser is able to capture that. So we know what our velocity is at each time. And so this is actually quite nice because we can see whether the Doppler system can also resolve these velocity fluctuations. So here we have a spectrogram showing the frequency content of the received response from the ultrasound array as a function of time during one of these moves. And I've drawn on here a white line, which is the Doppler shift we would expect based on the laser signal. And you can see an excellent agreement between the peak frequency that we receive back from the receive array and the uh, expected Doppler shift. So we are indeed able to measure velocity with a uh, time resolution in this case of about 16 milliseconds. And uh, we're able to uh, do this out to a distance of maybe a meter or so. 
um, in this particular, we, we can trade off some things here. So we, we have to choose a window length for doing the windowing in the spectrogram. So in this case, we have windows that are 16 milliseconds long. So we get uh, 60 up velocity updates per second, but that means we only have about a six centimeter per second resolution because of the, the uh, resolution of that Fourier transform with that length of time. Uh, so we could make a longer time window and get better velocity resolution and less velocity updates per second. So we can always trade those two off and we can do that dynamically. Uh, but the main point here is we have excellent agreement with the lasers, so we are indeed able to measure velocity with this system. Here's another example moving at a different velocity. We're starting out about uh, three quarters of a meter away from the array and moving towards it, so you can see the acoustics get louder as it gets closer, and uh, we are at all times able to measure the velocity of that plate. And here's a final example where the, a much slower move, so this is a 10 centimeter per second move, and so you can see the kind of uh, velocity resolution we have with this time window is about about half of this, about five centimeters per second. And um, yeah, so it works great. So thanks for your attention. We have this system we've built, designed uh, in collaboration with Draper Labs to do acoustic measurements using in-air ultrasound and MEMS transmit and receive arrays at high frequencies with a tight beam width, a range of about a meter or a meter and a half, and the ability to measure velocities on the order of a centimeter per second up to about 10 meters per second um, and we are excited about this system. We hope that we'll get to do some additional development to maybe shrink the electronics down, make the whole system smaller, and uh, get it into a better form factor. Uh, and also to do, we want to do some more measurements with different kinds of reflectors and other things. So there's plenty more to do, but we think we've demonstrated the basic idea here. And um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, looking at the video. Thanks for your attention.